I really, really enjoy being here and sharing a little bit of this uh, amazing adventure. Did you think of it that way? An amazing adventure? Well, it is. It's not boring, all right? I just wanted to share with that because I have been in such intense prayer over this time. You can't understand what that means to me. This is personal. <laughs> uh, you know, Brian Williams has a thing on the news. Listen to us because this is personal. You know, it's us. Well, it's personal because it's me. And we're walking an adventure together that's sort of amazing. You know, we've been here through the life of the Fellowship Church of God a lot of different times. You know, I didn't hear an amen from the back corner. Amen. amen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and it's always been at the most interesting times to be able to share with you and to just feel God work. It's really, really cool to see him work these things. This morning I want to share with you sort of an interesting message that ties with the one that I did on May 18th. Now how many remember that one? Oh, I'm sorry, I should never ask that question. But I had five people in a circle up here. Remember that one? Oh, yes. And they were all looking in different directions. And yelling. And yelling. And they couldn't agree on anything. And they were all kind of noisy and rowdy. JD, we're not going to mention any names or anybody, but it seemed like there were some that were more rowdy than others. <laughs> and then we had everybody turn and look up, and they could all agree. Okay? Now, the whole point of that was Jesus is the reason. He's everything. Okay? Because it takes all of our differences, of our personalities, of our gifts, of all the different things that we hold for our own personal agenda. And as we agree on Jesus, all those differences seem to fade away, and we have a unity of voice. Our choir gets a lot more harmonic. That was only the first message in a whole series. I'm going to get through several more this month. But the next sermon is, what's it all about? And I'm trying to say, okay, if Jesus is everything, which is a good place to start, I also want to add to that, I want everything that Jesus has. I want all of what Jesus has given us. Not that I just have Jesus as everything at the core, and then I only just take part of that and apply it to my life. I want everything he has for us. And so I tried to find in my own heart and my own spiritual quest, what was the driving force behind Jesus Christ? What drove his ministry? What was the motivation? What was the push that made him work? What got him out of bed in the morning? What kept him awake in the garden when everybody else was falling asleep? What was the push? Here's what the Lord showed me. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verse 34, this is the end of his ministry, and uh, Jewish leaders are pushing real hard to try and find some weakness in his presentation and his preaching, something that they could use against him, something that they could... Get the crowds back on their side. All right? So they came to Jesus, here, verse 34, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees, who really thought they were better at putting him in a corner than the Sadducees were, got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. There's nothing going to divide anybody quicker than politics and a question from the Pharisees. All right? I'm sorry, I never heard of that. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, you know there are ten big ones. Which one's the big one? 
That was the hidden question. Because other people had different opinions. So here's what Jesus answered. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Now, I want to share something with you because I don't think we really get the message. Jesus really loved his Father in heaven. Are you listening? Jesus really loved his Father in heaven. And when we read the stories of Jesus with that knowledge, with that insight, it changes a lot of the things that we thought we were reading in the scripture. It changes their intensity. It changes their, their emphasis. It changes a little bit of what it means to us when we respond to that. If Jesus is the subject.org, I want all of Jesus. Now, here's the thing, because I think it really is neat. Every bad report, okay, how many would think that we got a good report when uh, Lonnie Bullock came and gave us our assessment? That was a good report? Eh, a little scary. <laughs> all right, a little scary. Some good things, but there were some things that kind of put us on edge. Yeah. All right? Still didn't hear the amen from that corner. <laughs> amen. amen. All right. It causes us to go down and find our foundation stones again. Uh, several examples, just to kind of throw some out here. You remember 9-11? What happened when the Twin Towers fell? And they had several big old pieces of steel in the framework that were standing up as remem remembrances of what those towers had been, and they took them down very carefully, and they mounted a museum to say, never forget, it's never totally demolished. We have a foundation stone. And so there's a big cross that was standing there, and it's in the museum, and there are these big pillars from the framework that are in the museum, and they stand there as monuments. They went back, and they found the strength, the symbols of the strength of what had been the Twin Towers, and they remembered. All right? Once in a while, it's steel frames and steel structures. Uh, Hurricane Sandy came along here a couple, three years ago and burned down a little place called Breezy Point. Breezy Point was a, a suburb of New York City, and it had a whole bunch of firefighters, placement, and things. It had a, a real nice little community, and 111 homes were all destroyed. And you look at what the satellite picture looked like earlier and then after the storm, and it was just level. It was a big, empty black hole. But they discovered foundation stones. The foundation stones were that they loved each other in that community, and they helped and shared each other rebuild back what they had to have of that community fellowship. So sometimes it's steel, and sometimes it's that feeling that you have about what you want to do and rebuild again, but if you don't go back to the foundation stones, you haven't really gained the advantage of that disaster, and you've, you've lost the chance to remember what is most important. What's most important to the Church of God? What's most important to us? Uh, I went to seminary, oh, a lot of years ago, and they took me down to my foundation stones. They knocked apart everything that I believed. And they made me search for a new foundation stone. And I did. And I realized, as I sat there and looked at the empty tomb in Jerusalem, it should have stayed occupied. There should still be a body inside. 
There's no reason for that tomb to be empty today. You know, it'll probably have a big church over top of it or something. Probably does. <laughs> With a body inside. This is the tomb of Mohammed. This is the tomb of Buddha. This is the tomb of Confucius. This is the tomb of Sun Young Moon in Korea. This is the tomb. No. It's standing there open. And if that tomb is open, that changes everything. And now I can start to build on that one foundation stone. What Jim Lyon has done is he's gone back and he scraped away all the black burned out rubble from, from Breezy Point. <laughs> he's hauled off all of the concrete and steel junk and all the stuff from 9-11 in the trade centers. He's emptied the hole down to the bedrock. He's scraped away everything of the collapse of what didn't work, what's gone wrong, and he's focused on the most important thing. And here's what it is. Jesus Christ didn't come to bring glory to himself. Sometimes we miss that. He always came to bring glory to His Father in heaven. Uh, I was reading in John the ninth chapter about the man who was born blind. And the disciples came to Jesus and said, why did this happen to this man? Was it a sin of from Himself or was it a sin of His parents? You know. <coughs> Jesus said, neither. What was the reason? So that the work of the Father in heaven could be made real in His life. It changes our prayer when we realize Jesus really loved His Father and He brought all the glory and all the honor to His Father in heaven. Uh, I wish I had all afternoon I could share with you that last several chapters and the night when they went into that upper room and they had the Last Supper together and all the number of times when He said, My Father and I are one. Everything He told me to say, I have communicated to you. He didn't say I gave you everything I learned. He said, no, my father told me what to say. And I've given it to you. Every one of you was chosen before you chose me. Every one that the father gave me, gave me, I have taken care of. Everything he, he wanted done, I have done. Remember Thomas, oh, that wonderful guy that just seems to come up with the most interesting ways. I'm going to my Father. I'm going to my Father. I'm going to my Father. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back and get you. But I'm going to take you with me where my Father lives. And you know the way. And Thomas, um, we don't know the way. And then Jesus comes back with that one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We misunderstand that if we don't go back to the main point. The main point was how do I know the way to the Father? I am the way to my Father in heaven. I am the truth about my Father's love for you. I am the life that He has extended through me that comes directly from Him. My Father sent me, so send I you. My Father is our Heavenly Father that we pray about once in a while, our Father in Heaven, who art in Heaven, hallowed be Thy name. But we skip past a lot of the stuff thinking, oh, do you know the John 3.16? Can you say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not lie. All right? We read it and say, thank you, Jesus, for being God's Son to come and give us the chance to have eternal life. That wasn't what Jesus was saying. The story is God loved you 
God has a plan of salvation for you. God wants you to participate. I happen to be the messenger that came. But God had a plan. I want you to understand. When you look at the life of Jesus, you put that lens over your eyes, you start to read. You start to look at the little story about him when he was 12 years old and was uh, left behind when they were in Jerusalem. And what was his response when they found him three days later? I'm doing my father's business. What else did you expect? He really loved his father. Now, if you remember, Joseph was one of the ones who found him. And Joseph was a carpenter and did not do business in the temple. So which father was he in love with? Didn't he? He didn't love Joseph. He really loved his father. And then there's that story of the desert baptism. That's always puzzled me. John the Baptist was baptizing wretched sinners. Now the righteous people were standing on the bank going, well, I wouldn't get in the water with a bunch of those dirty folks. Those are people off the street. Those are the hungry. Those are the untouchable ones in society. And they're going down in the water and they're being baptized. And, and John's saying that God's preparing the way and forgiving them of their sins and the baptism is for the remission of sins. And that doesn't look very healthy to me. And then out of the crowd steps Jesus. Is he a sinner? No. Is he a wretch? No. Is he unclean? No. Then why did he step into the water and, and John the Baptist was the first one to admit it? Jesus, you're not supposed to be in here. You're supposed to be baptizing me. The, the roles are reversed this way. What are you doing? Jesus said, this is to fulfill all righteousness. This is to fulfill my Father's command. Let it be so for now. And so John baptized Jesus. And the doors of heaven opened, and the Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. Jesus really loved his Father. Would do anything for him. Even when it didn't look like he got that much love back in return. At least in the short run. Remember how the Spirit of God sent him out into the desert to spend 40 days without food and water? That was a hard assignment. <laughs> that was some tough commands. I'm going to leave you out there in the desert by yourself for 40 days. No support. Satan is going to bring every trick in the book against you. Why are you doing? Because he really, really loved his father. He really loved his father. And his father did not let him down. Because at the moment of his greatest need, he had his greatest strength. And he overcame everything. It was the most incredible turnaround in the history of the world. A guy that's ready to die of thirst and hunger. And when he's the weakest, Satan was still beat his own game. <laughs> most amazing story. Gethsemane. Splattered out all over that big old rock. I was there back in 77. I knelt down over that big old slab. Big old huge rock, bare stone foundation on there. I can just see him just face down, crying out, making the rock just wet with his tears. Oh, I don't want to do this. This is the hardest thing anybody's ever been given to do. I know exactly what's going to happen. It's nothing been hidden from me. Please, 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 if there is any other way. But not my will, but thine be done. You see, I wanted to share with you a picture 
This is the sermon for this morning. If you can see it. All right. It's a little picture I drew. Don't normally do that in my notes. I, I'm sorry, Seth, you can't see it back there. Hold eyes. But it's a picture. And what I want to draw a picture of is sitting right here on this communion table is the end of a giant steel titanium beam. Nothing like what that flimsy steel was that was twin towers. It's a support beam. It's a gigantic thing. Massive in its dimensions. And stronger than anything this world can produce. And it sits right here on the end of this table. And it stretches back through the ages of time and ties every ounce, every moment, every second of human experience into one gigantic backbone of strength all the way back through. And it's called God's plan for salvation. His loving plan for you. His plan of salvation for the church. His plan of salvation for the world. And it sets here because we're at the current time right now. You're going to add to it as time goes along, but right now it's sitting right here. And it stretches back through, all the way through the Reformation, all the way back through the, the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection on Easter Sunday morning, it goes back to that Last Supper on that Thursday night when he met with his disciples and he said, this is the meal I have been waiting to share with you. And what was it? It was the miracle of salvation and grace that God did every year since the escape from Egypt back on the very first Passover. And there on the pillar, that framework of God's love, stands Jesus Christ on the very same day. It's not random. It's not something that just happened that way. On the very same day, He meets with His disciples to say, and God's plan continues today and will continue into the future even if it has continued into the past. And you walk that back past and you, you, you walk back to where the captives were brought back out of Babylon. And they came back to a destroyed country. The walls were knocked down. The temple was gone. But they were home. They were home. God had saved them. After 70 years of waiting, God had saved them. And He was on the plan of salvation that God had already established. And you can go back a little bit farther and you can see the King David. And I think he danced on the beam. I think he danced on the, on the beam. Because when they were able to finally bring the tabernacle of the Lord back to Jerusalem and set it up where the new temple was going to be built by his son Solomon. And he came dancing and prancing and praising the Lord, he was dancing on that huge God plan beam of salvation for the nation. And his wife kind of looked at him and said, you're making a fool out of yourself. And he said, yeah, isn't it great? <laughs> because he saw the plan. And he loved it. He was excited about it. It was great. And you take it on back and you see there's Moses and he's standing in the middle of the beam with his staff in his hand and the Ten Commandments that God literally forged out of the mountain. It was like a blast furnace up there on the mountain. And God cut those stones away from the face of the rock and with his own finger printed the law. And what was the law? It was to bring salvation to the people. Listen to me. I want to be your God. I want you to follow me. And I will love and take care of you. 
then you follow along back a little farther, and, and that's the first Passover. There's going to be a great dividing tonight. There's going to be a weeping in his, Egypt like there's never, ever been known before. And every household that does not have the sign of the Lamb's blood on the doorpost is going to have the sorrow of a lost first son in every household. What a stupid thing to ask people to do. Take a hyssop bush, I mean, what we would consider a weed around here. I mean, it's just a just big old bramble. And dip it in a bowl of the blood that you have sacrificed of the lamb that you have prepared for the meal. And you dip it in that bowl of lamb's blood and you use that like a paintbrush and you put it up on the lintel over the door and on the doorpost and this is supposed to protect you? Come on, get real. This is the, the, the 900th century BC. We're beyond all that stuff. God had a plan. God was going to save a whole bunch of little kids. He's going to save the firstborn of Egypt, or the, of Israel, out of Egypt, and they were going to be set free to be His people. God had a plan of loving salvation. And those that did that silly thing were able to walk out as whole families into a new life. And then you, you follow the bean back just a little farther. Just a little bit farther. Go on back a little bit. Go past Joseph. Walk back just a little farther and there's Abraham. And there he stands on Mount Sinai, the holy mountain of God. And he's walked up with his son Isaac, carrying firewood, carrying the knife, carrying the spark that's going to start the fire of the sacrifice. But Father, I've been to some of these before and there's something missing. Father, can I ask a question? Where's the sacrifice? Father, did you forget? This is sort of important, I remember. And Abraham looked at his son that God had provided. He said, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And there was a sorrowful sacrifice prepared on the top of the mountain of God. And the stones were gathered and built back up to make the altar. And the wood was laid out carefully upon. Then it was time to lay Isaac down and bind him hand and foot. And for an aged father to lift his only son up on top of that wood and take the knife and raise it up over top of him. While God was asking the question, Abraham, do you love me more than him? Abraham, do you love him more than me? A decision has to be made. A turning point has to be made. And as the knife came down, God's hand stopped it. And said, no, Abraham, not today. And he looked over, and there was a ram with its horns caught in a thorn bush. The ram wasn't there when he built the altar. The ram wasn't there when he laid out the wood. The ram wasn't there when he bound up his son. The ram wasn't there when he took the knife. But when God said, stop, there was a ram. <laughs> Why? I want you to get goosebumps this morning. 
Why? Because God had a plan. His loving plan was so powerful, it was so amazing, that that was not just a normal sacrifice. That ram was a beautiful animal. In my heart, in my picture, in my head, I can see this ram as being the prized animal out of a thousand flocks, perfect and without spot. And now it's got its head stuck in the thorns of the bush. Stuck in the thorns on the mountain of God. When Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life abundant. He was talking about the plan that God gave him, the mission he'd been sent to do that was going to change everything. My friends, I'm going to tell you the truth. When we fall in love with the Father's plan of salvation, when we follow the, the way that Jesus gave us to learn about the loving grace of our Father in heaven. We will change the world. Abraham changed the world. Became the ancestor of a nation that's more numerous than the sands of the beach. David changed the world. We still sing his songs of love. Moses changed the world. He brought a new nation into existence. Jesus changed the world. With just a handful of followers, he turned the whole world, political and social and economic, upside down. Paul changed the world when he took the message of God's plan of salvation through all of the known Gentile world. My friends, the end of that beam sets right here, the Fellowship Church God. I make you a promise. You fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and you learn to love His Father in heaven and you will change the world. You will change the world. And just